3D sub parliamentarians from England and Pakistan, Lord McRae, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In 1989, I was awarded the Hilal e Qadiyazm for my work in the 1980s in the movement for the restoration of democracy in Pakistan under the leadership of the late Nawab Zada Nasrullah Khan, recalled. In the early 1990s, I was awarded the Helale Pakistan for my work on Kashmir. The, by the grace of God, democracy seems to have caught on finally in Pakistan, and parliaments are succeeding each other normally and lawfully, prime ministers being elected and re-elected. But Kashmir remains in bondage. Bondage now for the last 105 days or so. More wicked, more evil than ever before in the history of these 70 plus years. The clue to why we are here is in the title of the seminar, Human Rights in Occupied Kashmir. Just as you cannot support West Bromwich, Albion, and Wolverhampton Wanderers, or Celtic and Rangers, just as you cannot be a little bit pregnant, you cannot have human rights in an occupied territory. This is a contradiction in terms. The photographs behind me of cruelty and wickedness being visited by the occupiers on the occupied is not because the perpetrators are Indian, still less because they are Hindus, uh, they are behaving in this way because they are occupiers. And all occupation ends this way. I'm old enough to remember when Israeli propagandists used to say that the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza was the most benign occupation in human history. And look what it has become. It has become exactly what we are seeing unfolding in Kashmir today. Because an occupied people will always resist. They may resist peacefully. They may resist violently. Although, as President Kennedy said, those who make peaceful change impossible make violent change inevitable, something that the Indian authorities should now contemplate again. But an occupied people will always resist a foreign occupation of their land and their way of life. And therefore, human rights have to ineluctably must be shredded bit by bit as it becomes obvious that there is no acceptance of occupation by the occupied people. And so I say down this camera now in the hope that they will hear me, I salute the struggling people of Kashmir defending <laughs> defending their hearth and home, defending their fields and their crops, defending their way of life, 
defending their mothers, their wives, their sisters, their daughters, defending their dignity and honor. I salute the families of the martyrs. I salute those held in their scores of thousands in the dungeons of that occupation, some of whom have been freed today by militant action by the freedom fighters in Kashmir. Glory be to God. I salute all of the people of the occupied land in their resistance. And as long as one of them is still resisting, I am certain that all of the people of Pakistan and all of the freedom lovers of the world will stand by them, will struggle to come to their side, to their aid. The picture is, of course, not bright. The suffering, especially in these last hundred plus days, has intensified. We heard from Ambassador Sheikh earlier that the apples may not even be harvested, that the saffron cannot be sold. People are hungry. People are without medicine, cannot travel. They have been switched off, blacked out, cut off from the rest of the world. Even their own families do not know whether their relatives are alive or dead. But as long as the people in the occupied land do not give up, to use a phrase from my parliamentary colleague earlier, an occupied people that does not give up, does not agree to go in to the museum of X peoples does not agree to live under the boot of their occupier, then it doesn't matter whether India sends 1 million, 2 million, 10 million occupation soldiers, they will still not succeed in breaking the will of the people that they subjugate. There have been important changes in this last hundred days. Things are being written in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, in the German media, even in the English media, which lags behind on this as on so many other things that would never have been written before. Why is that? Well, I don't intrude on internal Pakistani politics in any way. It's up to you what you think of your Prime Minister. But I think he played a blinder at the United Nations. I think he knocked India for six out of the, over the boundary and out of the ground, a captain's innings. And I'm here to tell you, though I'm not his party man, that Pakistan finally has a political leader more popular internationally than the political leadership in India. I've lived a long life and that has never happened before. Both because of the star quality of your leader, but also because the world detects the whiff, the smell, of extremism about Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The world detects a whiff of the ethnic cleanser. The world can smell this ambition of ethno-supremacist exclusiveness about Narendra Modi and they are anxious and worried about it, because we have had some experience in the lifetime of people still alive today of where 
ethno supremacist can take their own country and indeed the wider world, the whole world as it happened. And this is why I say, I quote him again to Ambassador Shea, it is a false dichotomy to say that we are concerned about the situation in Kashmir and consider it to be unsustainable, but to merrily sign the trade deals and search the market in India. This is a false dichotomy because I believe that if not checked, Modi will lead India to disaster. He will break his country. He will see it unravel. He will see erupting all kinds of secessionist and other struggles. He will not be able to impose this Hindutva mania that he imagines, not just in Kashmir, but with the Sikh people and other minorities, Christian people, other minorities in India. And at which point the Indian market won't look so attractive. Investment in India will not look like such a good investment. So I caution the great people of India, do not allow this man to continue his madcap adventure with your future and the future of the region. I have little time left to speak, so I say this. This is not an internal matter for India. If it were internal, the Article 370 would never have existed in the first place. If it were an internal matter, there would have been no prohibition on the settlement of Kashmir by all and sundry. Neither is it a bilateral matter. First of all, if it's a bilateral matter, then the voices of the people of occupied Kashmir themselves cannot be heard and taken into account. It's a multilateral matter because two of the potential belligerents are armed with nuclear weapons which could end life in this part of the world where a quarter of the world's population lives and could escalate into a conflagration which would burn all of us. And therefore, the world has a duty to come onto the field of play here. And we must mobilize public opinion. We have to up our game, Mr. President. We do a lot. We hold protests and meetings and hand out leaflets without number. But our work is not good enough in terms of quality. And I hope that this wonderful CPSD can address this question, the quality of propaganda. Otherwise, we're merely preaching to the faithful. We're merely preaching to the choir. We have to reach those people who still think Kashmir is a scarf, a shawl, or an overcoat. We have to reach these people who don't actually care very much if poor brown Muslim children in the valley of Kashmir perish. It will not put them off their boiled eggs in the morning. We have to reach them and persuade them that it does matter to them, if not as human beings, then as people who may be endangered by this situation spiraling out of control. I look forward to the address of His Excellency, the respected President of Pakistan. I'm grateful for your attention. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.